Hi everybody, so uh, uh, we're going to move on to the cranial nerve examination. So cranial nerve 1 is the olfactory nerve. It sits right here at the uh, base of the skull or the roof of the nasal uh, cavity. Um, smell can be uh, checked such as uh, presenting the patient with uh, 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 closing the patient's eyes and presenting them with various smells such as peppermint or coffee grounds and ask the patient to uh, identify the smell. Um, smell should be uh, is very important for taste or for flavor of food. So when you eat a nice steak or have ice cream, the flavor molecules will diffuse from uh, from your from behind your palate up into your nasal cavity, and that's what gives the flavor of food. Taste is governed by an entirely different two sets of uh, uh, cranial nerves, cranial nerve seven and nine. And taste is your salt, sour, bitter, and sweet. Okay, and those can be uh, tested with various items by placing them on the tongue. We move on to uh, cranial nerve two, which is the optic nerve. The optic nerve uh, can be checked with visual acuity using a Snellen chart. We can also uh, uh, check, uh, do visual field uh, testing with confrontational uh, testing. I won't go into those aspects because you will learn those things on your ophthalmology and internal medicine rotations. We will, however, go through the extraocular uh, movements. Cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6 control extraocular movements. So Brittany, I'm going to ask you to, to take a look at the uh, tip of my Q-tip here. And I'm going to make you follow the tip of this Q-tip in an H pattern. Okay? So just keep your head still, but just move your eyes. And tell me if you experience any double vision. How is that for you? No double vision. No double vision. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, double vision can be uh, vertical diplopia or horizontal diplopia, and that can give you an indication of uh, which muscles are involved and which cranial nerves are involved. We'll move on to uh, cranial nerve uh, number five now, because we've done cranial nerve number one, olfactory, cranial number uh, two, uh, the optic nerve, cranial numbers three, four, and six which control extraocular um, uh, movements, and now cranial nerve uh, number five. So cranial number five um, is important for uh, sensation. So Brittany, I'm going to ask you, tell me, does this feel the same as this? Yes. Okay, that's the ophthalmic distribution. Does this feel the same as this? That's a maxillary distribution. Does this feel the same as this? Yes. That's a mandibular nerve of distribution. Cranial nerve number five also controls the uh, muscles of mastication. We have the temporalis muscle that sits up here and the master muscle that sits over here. So, Brittany, I'm going to ask you to open your mouth and clench your teeth. And I can feel the temporalis muscle contract. Similarly, you can see the master muscle contract here as well. Open up your mouth and close and bite. And I can feel the master muscle contract. Cranial nerve number seven. This is responsible for uh, mus the muscles of facial expression. There are five different branches of cranial nerve number seven. We have the frontal branch, which controls the movement of the forehead. So I'll get you to raise up your eyebrows. That's the frontal branch. There's a zygomatic branch that controls the orbicularis muscle and allows us to close your eyes. So close your eyes tightly. You can also check the strength of that muscle by actually trying to pry the eyes open. So Brittany has very good strength there. Um, we have a, uh, a, a buccal branch here that controls the buccinator uh, muscle. The buccinator muscle will prevent food from collecting inside her cheek here when she, when she eats. It will actually move the food in between her teeth and um, uh, help her with, with the uh, uh, with the oral, fa uh, oral preparation phase of uh, swallowing. It also can be tested by asking Brittany to blow her cheeks out. So, when she blows her cheeks out, she's able to maintain uh, the confidence of this, uh, this area here because of the buccinator muscle, but also because of the orbicularis oris muscle. Okay, marginal mandibular nerve. So Brittany, could you please smile for us? 
good. Nice big smile there. Uh, as you can see, when Brittany smiles, go ahead and smile again, Brittany. The depressor labia inferioris, these muscles here are holding the lip down. If she had a marginal mandibular nerve paresis, this muscle, her lip would go like this. Now smile again. This would come. This this corner of her lip would come up, kind of like Jean Chrétien. Okay. We'll go on to cranial nerve number eight now, which is your vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, there are, uh, as you know, that the vestibular portion is responsible for uh, balance. Um, the uh, cochlear portion is responsible for uh, hearing. When we're testing hearing, we can use the 1024 uh, hertz uh, tuning fork. Hearing uh, speech is somewhere in the range of between 500 to 3000 hertz. So this is a good tuning fork to use for you to test your hearing. All right. So we're going to do two tests. One is called the Rene test and another is called the Weber test. So what you do is you take the tuning fork and we're going to have to find something to bang it on. So we're going to use the corner of my elbow here. And when I, when I bang the tuning fork to do the, uh, to do the Rene test, it's very important that I hold the tuning fork in front of her ear like this, not like this. The reason of holding the tuning fork in this orientation is because the tuning fork will vibrate like this, allowing Brittany to hear it better. If I hold it in this orientation, the vibrations will go out more in this direction. So this is to check for air conduction, and then I take the tuning fork and carefully place it on the, on the mastoid bone back here. That is bone, uh, bone conduction. What do I mean by that? Air conduction will, is a sound that's going to go through Brittany's ear canal, vibrate her eardrum, vibrate the ossicles, the middle ear will amplify the sound and make it louder, and then it will go through the cochlea and she will hear it. When I put the tuning fork back here, there will be no amplification of sound. It will directly vibrate the cochlea. So Brittany, the sound will be, we expect the sound to be louder in front of your ear than behind your ear. Okay? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Good. Perfect. So I'm going to bang this and let's, let's make sure things are good mm -hmm. here. So I can use your knee or your elbow, maybe we'll use my elbow here. Okay. So is this louder, Brittany, in front of your ear? or behind your ear? In front of my ear. In front of your ear. That is a normal Rene's test, okay? If the sound were louder behind Brittany's ear than in front of her ear, that would suggest that she has some conductive hearing loss. Okay, good. So, um, if Brittany, you had sensor neural hearing loss, meaning damage to the cochlea, the amplification system in the middle ear would still be working, so the sound in front of your ear would still be louder than the sound behind your ear. Does that make uh, sense? Good. Perfect. So we'll do the, uh, the Weber test now. The Weber test essentially is I'm placing the tuning fork either on the center of Brittany's head, like this, or I can get her to put her teeth together. Show me your teeth there. And I can actually put it right on her teeth here. The bottom line is that we are vibrating the skull and the sound to travel simultaneously to both cochleas. And she should, in the normal test, she should hear them equally as loud. Okay? So, let's try it out. Here we go. So, Brittany, where do you hear it? Do you hear it louder in this ear or your, your other ear? Same. So the sound is the same both in the right and the left ear. That suggests that um, uh, there is uh, no, uh, the hearing with both cochleas is the same. Okay? If Brittany had, let's say, conductive hearing loss on, on, on this side, Brittany would actually hear the loud, uh, the sound louder in this ear because the conductive hearing loss will mask out, will block all the external environment noise and that's why you hear the tuning fork louder in the ear that you have conductive hearing loss in. Alternatively, if Brittany had sensor neural hearing loss in her left ear, she would hear the sound 
louder in her better cochlea, which would be the contralateral right ear. Make sense? Good. Perfect. Okay. So we'll move on now to the uh, cranial nerve uh, 9. Okay. Brittany is not going to be happy with me right now. Okay. Because she knows what's coming. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look inside Brittany's mouth. I'm going to get you to open up. Okay. And the tonsillar fossas are supplied by cranial nerve 9. So cranial nerve 9 provides sensation uh, 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 to, the, uh, to the tonsillar area and also supplies the styro stylopharyngeus muscle. So there's a reflex here called the gag reflex. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick the tongue depressor to the back here. And there she goes. There is the gag. That's a good gag reflex. We can also test the cranial nerve 9 on the other side uh, to check for the gag reflex. But we won't do that today. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the next cranial nerve is cranial nerve number uh, 10. Cranial nerve number 10 is responsible for elevating the soft palate. So, the way we do that, again, put it back here. We can check cranial nerve number 10, which is responsible for elevation of the uh, soft palate, by asking Brittany to go, ah. Uh, uh. And you can see there's symmetrical elevation of her palate. The uvula remains in the midline. If, however, let's say Brittany had a lesion of her, of her vagus nerve or cranial nerve number 10 at the level of the jugular foramen, we would expect that the uvula would deviate towards the stronger side being her uh, uh, right, the right side of her palate. So a lesion of the left vagus nerve will cause the uvula to deviate to the contralateral normal right-hand side. So we'll now test for the spinal accessory nerve or cranial nerve uh, number 11. And cranial nerve number 11 um, essentially originates from the skull base, crosses the anterior uh, carotid triangle here, goes behind the uh, goes deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and goes into the trapezius muscle here. So, um, it's responsible for uh, allowing Brittany to elevate her shoulders. So, Brittany will ask you to shrug your shoulders. So, as she shrugs the shoulders, I try to push down to test the strength of the muscle. So, she's very strong. Okay? <laughs> you do not want to jump Brittany in, <laughs> in an alley. She will beat you up. Um, Brittany's head can also, we can also check the sternocleidomastoid muscle here, its strength, by asking Brittany to apply some pressure to my hand here. So, she's applying a lot of pressure and asking to stop because I'm getting tired. <laughs> so, that is cranial nerve number 11. Okay, stick your tongue out, Brittany. So, Brittany is now sticking out her tongue at me, um, and we're checking for cranial nerve uh, number uh, 12. As you can see, when she sticks out her tongue, it comes out symmetrically, indicating that both uh, cranial nerve 12s are, uh, are uh, hypoglossal nerves are working appropriately. If Brittany, however, had a lesion involving her right uh, hypoglossal uh, nerve, what would occur is the tongue would deviate out towards the right hand side, as she is demonstrating here. Okay, so that's, that ends our discussion on the cranial nerves.